The next topic on our agenda is a presentation from the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. In 2011 and 2015, the ELCIC and Convention made commitments to promote right and renewed relationships between non-Indigenous and Indigenous peoples within Canada, to deepen our understanding of history, and to take action for reconciliation. This presentation by the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation is one step in our commitment to deepen our understanding of history. The National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, the NCTR, was created to preserve the memory of Canada's residential school system and legacy, not just for a few years, but forever. Officially opening in the summer of 2015, the NCTR is the permanent home for all statements, documents, and other materials gathered by the Truth and Reconciliation Command Commission of Canada. The NCTR is located on the University of Manitoba campus, not far from where we are right now. In the 94 calls to action, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission identifies the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as the framework for reconciliation. At, you, at your tables, you will have received a copy of the Declaration. In addition, you've received a copy of a book called Truth and Reconciliation, I believe. Calls to Action for Truth and Reconciliation. One way of growing in understanding of, rec of reconciliation is to read both of those documents. While the Declaration is available online, the booklet is an a reminder of the importance of the principles and the rights it contains. There's something about that tangible thing. You might also consider giving the booklet to someone else in order to begin a conversation on the meaning of reconciliation. We welcome our guest today, Kayla Johnson. Kayla is the research coordinator at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. She is a Cree woman born and raised in Winnipeg, Manitoba. She has completed a, an Honours BA in Criminal Justice from the University of Winnipeg, as well as an MSc in International Crimes and Criminal, Criminology from, yes, uh, Virgi Universiteit in Amsterdam, and I'm sorry for butchering. Previous to her position at the NCTR, Kyla, Kayla was a former statement gatherer and equipment coordinator for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. As the Community Engagement Coordinator for the NCTR, Kayla assisted in the coordination of the community engagements with her colleague with a focus on completing a written report for each one. In the near future, Kayla will also be working closely with the research team on upcoming projects developed by the NCTR. Please join me in welcoming Kayla. trying to get this adjusted here, being so short. <clears throat> here we go. Perfect. Hello, my name is Kayla Johnston, and as mentioned, I am the research coordinator at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. I've worked in the field of reconciliation in various aspects, from statement gathering and coordinating events for the TRC, to research and coordinating outreach and engagement for the NCTR. While working, with both the TRC and NCTR over the span of seven years, it has allowed me the opportunity to travel across Canada to speak and engage with survivors, intergenerational survivors, as well as former staff and other individuals whose lives were and still are affected by the residential school system. I've seen firsthand the effects of the colonial system of oppression and have felt them as well. This morning, I'm going to be talking to you about the history of residential schools, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, as well as the long path forward striving for reconciliation. <clears throat> for over a century, the central goals of Canada's Indigenous policy were to eliminate Indigenous governments, ignore Indigenous rights, terminate the treaties, and through a process of assimilation, cause Indigenous peoples to cease to exist as a distinct legal, social, cultural, religious, and racial entities in Canada. 
The establishment and operation of residential schools was a central element to this policy, which can best be described as cultural genocide, the destruction of structures and practices that allow a group to continue to be a group. The residential school system formally came into effect in the late 1800s. However, church-run mission schools were in existence six, since the 1600s. Over the course of their operation, it is estimated that over 150,000 children went through these schools. And while residential schools had largely wound down by the 1980s, the last residences did not close until the mid-1990s. <clears throat> Government and church officials often said that the role of residential schools was to civilize and Christianize indigenous children. When put into practice, these ambitions translated into assault on indigenous culture, language, spiritual beliefs, and practices. Controlling costs became a primary concern for the federal government, and in 1892, the schools were switched to a per capita system under which churches were paid a set amount per student. This system provoked schools to compete with one another to enroll the maximum number of students, even if they were in poor health or suffering from infectious diseases. In 1931, the system reached its peak operation with 80 schools running. Even as the number of schools declined in the coming years, the number of students in attendance increased. The assault on Indigenous identity began the moment the child crossed the school's threshold. They were stripped of their belongings, roughly bathed, examined for vermin, and braided hair, which held spiritual significance, was cut. Student life was highly regimented, with bells dictating when students were to wake, pray, eat, sleep, study, and play. Attracting and keeping good teachers was an ongoing problem from the very start. Low pay and staggering workloads made the job unattractive for teachers with very high turnover rates. In most schools, there were too few teachers, too many responsibilities, with the operation of these institutions running on what amounted to voluntary labor. Many of the teachers employed by residential schools would not have been able to get jobs in the reg regular school system. A 1948 study found that over 40% of staff had no professional training. These numbers did improve to only 10% by 1962. In 1913, Duncan Campbell Scott, Deputy Minister of Indian Affairs, acknowledged that it is quite within the mark to say 50% of the children who passed through these schools did not live to benefit from the education they received therein. Tuberculosis, influenza, pneumonia, and general lung disease plagued schools and accounted for 50% of the known causes of death. Now, although death rates fell beginning in the 1940s, there are no clear records of how many children died in these schools. A January 2015 statistical analysis of the named register identified 2,040 students, while an analysis of named and unnamed register combined identified 3,201 deaths. The odds of dying in a residential school in the early 1900s was one in two, while the odds of dying did improve to one in 25 in later years. These were still worse odds compared to soldiers fighting in World War II who faced a one in 26 chance of dying. Throughout the system's history, children who died at these schools were buried in school or mission cemeteries, often in poorly marked graves. The closure of these schools has, in many cases, led to the abandonment of these cemeteries. Presently, there are over 144 identified cemeteries. <clears throat> Physical, sexual, and emotional abuse were common occurrences from the onset of these schools. When action was taken, it was often in the form of dismissal or, in some cases, transfers rather than prosecution. The lack of publicity often made it possible for a dismissed abuser to find work in another school in another part of the country. In an underfunded, undersupervised system, there was little protection for children. Overall, residential schools often amounted to a system of institutionalized child neglect. Resistance occurred both passively and aggressively from students, parents, and communities. Children resisted and rebelled by frustrating authority figures, stealing food, fighting back, running away, and setting fires. 
There were over 50 major fires at residential schools, with many of them being set by the students themselves. To run away back to their homes often posed a great risk to students. However, to some, it was a risk worth taking. There are at least 33 known cases of students having died or gone missing during an escape. Both parents and communities lobbied for day schools, for on-reserve boarding schools, for better food, less discipline, more education, and less drudgery. <clears throat> students involved in sports, music, drama, art, and dance found that these activities helped maintain a sense of value and were a source of pride and strength. Teams such as hockey, football, and baseball provided many students with a refuge and a chance to leave the residential school to travel to compete against other schools. Unfortunately, recreational and, and arts activities were always underfunded and undersupplied like other departments in these schools. In 2006, negotiations were approved between the legal advisors for survivors, the churches, the Assembly of First Nations, the Government of Canada, and other organizations to implement the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. It was formed as a fair, comprehensive, and lasting resolution to the legacy of Indian residential schools, as well as to promote healing, education, commemoration, truth, and reconciliation. There are five major components to the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. There's the Common Experience Payment, the independent assessment process, funding for healing programs, funding for commemoration, as well as the establishment of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. On June 1, 2008, the TRC was founded as a holistic and comprehensive response to the Indian residential schools. Three commissioners were appointed, however, they resigned shortly thereafter. However, commissioners, the Honourable Senator Marie Sinclair, Dr. Marie Wilson and Chief Wilton Child were appointed in 2009. There were eight components to the TRC's mandate. They included commemoration, regional liaisons, missing children and unmarked burial project, community events, national events, statement gathering, document collection, as well as the final report. Statement gathering consisted of an in-person statement-taking process where former students, their family, staff, or other individuals could provide audio, video, or written statements about their residential school experience. There were public hearings, public sharing circles, as well as public and private one-on-one -on -one statements recorded. In the NCTR's collection, we have over 7,000 hours of audio, video footage collected from over 6,700 individuals. Document collection consisted of the creation of an accurate and public historical record of the past regarding the policies and operations of former residential schools, what happened to the children who attended them, and what former employees recall of their experiences. <clears throat> After a lengthy review process, the TRC awarded custodianship to the TRC archives to the University of Manitoba. The National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation officially opened its doors to the public in the summer of 2015. The NCTR is the final home for all statements, documents and materials gathered by the TRC during its six-year mandate. When I give these presentations, I like to use this quote by George Erasmus. It reads, if the stories of our people are not accessible to the general public, it will be as if their experiences never occurred. And if their voices are rendered as museum pieces, it will be as if their experiences are frozen in time. What we need are open, dynamic, and interactive spaces and participatory forms of narrative knowledge and research. And this is a very fitting way to step into the 21st century and into a new kind of relationship. The reason I like to start off with this quote is because it is a very good representation of our center. When you think of an archive, you may think of Library and Archives Canada or the Manitoba Archives, where you are really restricted to their eight to four time slot to go down and visit those archives, to visit those records. The difference to our centre is that the majority of our records are available online, meaning you are able to access and take a look at these documents from your home computer, from an office, really anywhere that you have access to a public internet connection. There are three major units to the NCTR, archives, education and outreach, and research. 
The Archives Unit works to honour, safeguard and continue to acquire documents on residential schools, as well as provide access to church, government and survivor records and support research to revitalize and recover knowledge of Indigenous communities. The Education and Outreach Unit works to bring existing educator and classroom resources to uh, to the forefront, as well as provide education support for the use of these materials, partner with organizations and communities to assist in the development of new resources, as well as partner with education systems to create a stronger and better equipped support system for teachers and students. The research unit promotes and advances research in the areas related to the legacy of residential schools, support graduate and undergraduate programs, establish and develop research relationships, as well as foster collaboration between the research community and Indigenous peoples. There are three record types held at the Centre. Government records, including police files, Indian agent files and hospital records. Survivor records, such as statements, poetry, music and artefacts. As well as church records, which include photographs, stool, student newsletters, cemetery records and religious records. When you visit our database, you will be able to research a residential school, review documents, as well as watch statements. When you visit the website, this is the first image that will greet you. At the top, you will see there are a list of tabs from news, about, education, research, archives, and reports. Under the research tab, you will actually be able to take a look at our monitoring project for the calls to action, where you can read about the actions, the support, as well as background information for each call to action, which is separated by legacy and reconciliation and the different tabs. Under the reports section, you are able to download all of the TRC's reports as well as modern reports released and historical reports. There is also audio files of the TRC's final report read in traditional Indigenous languages. If you scroll down a little further on the page, you will see a list of residential schools and events separated by region. If you click on any one of those drop down menus, you'll get the full list of those schools. Well, just below that, we have an interactive map which shows all of the locations of the recognized residential schools in Canada. There is a timeline at the bottom. I don't know if I timed it properly, so it may be kind of jumping around. But if you drag one of the little red bars there, you can watch as residential schools open across Canada. And you can also watch as residential schools close. All of the red dots represent all of the residential schools. The blue represent the hearings and the orange represent the national events held across Canada. You can zoom into different regions on Canada to take a look at residential schools. Here I zoomed in on schools in Manitoba with a focus on a school in the PAW. If you click on that little red dot, it will bring you to this page here, which shows you a little more detail about that residential school. It gives you some background information as well as the list and links to all of the documents that are publicly currently available. There is also a little map that if you zoom in on it, you can actually get fairly close to see residential schools and where it was actually located. This is an example of one of the documents you can click on here. It's actually a quarterly return. Now, due to the setup, I, wasn't, I was unable to actually pull up the document, but the quarterly return is a list of all the students in the school for that quarter. So this is a very good way for survivors and intergenerational survivors to take a look to see if they can see their name or their family's name in the school register. Now, in 2016, the Environics Institute for Survey Research conducted the Canadian Public Opinion on Indigenous Peoples. There were a handful of questions asked about residential schools, their impacts, and reconciliation. Four out of ten people had heard about the TRC, but very few could recall anything specific about the calls to action. The legacy from residential schools and the political and legal policies and mechanisms surrounding their history continue to this day. Despite the challenges and failings in response to the legacy, the TRC was cautiously optimistic that the promising pathways to constructive reform do exist. 
To redress the legacy of residential schools and advance reconciliation, the TRC made 94 calls to action. These include calls on education, health, justice, equity, church apologies, museums and archives, media, sports, business, and newcomers, just to name a few. In the TRC's final report, there are 10 principles of reconciliation that are outlined. The first of which, which states, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is the framework for reconciliation. The question is, what is a framework for reconciliation? Well, it is one in which Canada's political and legal systems, educational and religious institutions, the corporate sector and civil society function in a way that are consistent with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. By adopting the Declaration, the Government of Canada is making progress towards achieving consensus with Indigenous Peoples on the minimum standards necessary for their survival, dignity and well-being. UNDRIP consists of 46 articles that describe specific rights and actions the government must take to protect Indigenous rights. These articles address the most significant issues affecting Indigenous peoples. Their civil, political, social, economic and cultural rights, and they also bear on the right to self-determination, spirituality, language, ta lands, territories, resources, and especially free and prior informed consent. <clears throat> when the Canadian public opinion poll asked what reconciliation meant between Indigenous peoples and Canadians, participants came up with a handful of answers, which included equity, public apologies, healing, and better relations. The concept of reconciliation means many different things to many different people, communities, institutions, and organizations. During its mandate, the TRC defined reconciliation as an ongoing process of establishing and maintaining respectful relationships. The question is, what is a respectful relationship? Well, it includes safety, encouragement, honesty, trust, caring, the freedom to be yourself, listening, and valuing opinions. Everyone has the right to feel safe, to be treated with fairness, to be valued and feel accepted for who they are. The question I pose for you is, are there safe spaces in your community for Indigenous peoples to come in and so you too can come together to begin this process of reconciliation? A critical part of reconciliation involves repairing damaged trust by making apologies, providing individual and collective reparations, and following through with real clear actions that demonstrate societal change. What you must keep in mind is that reconciliation is both a process and a goal. There is no finish line to cross at the end of the day where we can all stand up and say, reconciliation has been achieved. It will continue to go long after this conversation here has ended. Another question asked by the survey is, do individual Canadians have a role in bringing about reconciliation? More than 84% of those people asked believe that they did indeed have a role. Compared to survey results for 2008, there was a large jump in the number of people who believe they can be a part of the reconciliation process. A frequent question we are asked at the center is, what can I do? When facing this question, it's important to keep in mind that these calls to action are for all Canadians and not just for people at the provincial, territory or federal government levels. Now, there's actually a list of actions of reconciliation you can do. For instance, you can learn the history between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, understand the history and legacy of residential schools, explore the unique intersections between treaty, constitutional, Indigenous and human rights, recognize the rich contributions Indigenous peoples have had to this country, take action to address historical injustices and present-day wrongs, as well as teach others. Now the question comes to, what does that look like? Well, I have an example for you. One of the calls to action that speaks to me is number six, and it states, we call upon the Government of Canada to repeal Section 43 of the Criminal Code. Now, for a question for the audience, how many are familiar with the Criminal Code, and do they know what Section 43 is? Well, I will tell you. 
Section 43 is also known as the spanking law. It follows, every school teacher, parent, or person standing in place of a parent is justified in using force by the way of correction towards a pupil or child as they may be who is under their care if the force does not exceed what is reasonable under the circumstances. Debate on section 43 Debates around Section 43 because some view it as a justification of violence against children in the name of correction. However, it is in contrary to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The TRC believes that corporal punishment is a relic of a discredited past and has no place in the Canadian home or school. The act needs to be repealed as it violates human rights, risks physical and psychological harm to children, contradicts the Health Canada advice on children, undermines education of the child, and contributes to violence. There are several countries such as Sweden, Finland, Norway, Austria, Denmark, that have removed support for similar codes of corporal punishment in their system. Presently, Bill S-206 introduced in 2015 asks to repeal Section 43 of the Criminal Code and is currently in the second reading as of July 8th. Now, if we think back to those uh, actions of reconciliation, how can we apply it to this case? Well, firstly, you can learn and understand the history of legacy of residential schools, as well as the history of corporal punishment in Canada. You can read about discipline and punishment in the TRC reports, as well as learn more about the current state of corporal punishment in Canada and in the world by visiting websites such as repeal section 43 or endcorporalpunishment.com. You can also explore the rights of children by reading the UN Convention on Rights of the Child, as well as other international and regional human rights treaties, which require a state to prohibit corporal punishment of children in all settings of their lives. You can recognize that there are alternatives to corporal punishment, which you can read about from the Center of Effective Discipline. You can take action by contacting your ministers, your senators and MPs to tell them your stance on section 43. You can reach out to organizations and media to show your support as well as to organize events and circulate petitions. Finally, and most importantly in all, in my opinion, is that you can teach others. You can hold workshops, presentations or debates on section 43, corporal punishment and or alternative forms of discipline. I'd like to thank you for your time here today and for listening to my presentation on this very important topic. The 94 calls to action and 46 articles of UNDRIP are now in your hands in that nice little pocket-sized booklet we handed out. I encourage you to flip through that booklet and find a call to action that really resonates to you. An important piece of advice that we received from Dr. Marie Wilson was, you don't have to do all 94. <laughs> Just pick one. All you need to do is pick one and engage in those acts of reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla. That was an incredible presentation, so informative and so instructive. Um, our church has made a commitment to walk in the path of reconciliation, to work for right, right relationships, restored relationships. But what you have done is you've helped us um, um, to re-engage in the learning, but you've also given us a, an excellent challenge, and I thank you for that. The way you took one recommendation and broke it down um, I think was inspirational to all of us, and I think we've all recognized we're going home with more homework. Um, and that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. So thank you for engaging us. Thank you for taking time to be with us. Um, thank you for helping us. Much appreciated. A small token of our thanks for you.